Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord today. We're so glad that you're here. I'd let you know that the flowers on the altar today are given by Chris and Derek Glenn. They're given in honor of Pastor Bud and Debbie Miller. Wow. All right. <laughs> For leading our church family for the last four years. So Debbie and I are blessed by that. As you may know, uh, next week there's just one service. It's at 1030. And so I invite you to come join us for worship at 1030. Immediately following that, there will be a lunch down in Jeter Hall uh, and some good fellowship and celebration there. And so uh, it is a catered lunch. If you'd like to bring dessert, you can. That is, dessert is the kind of thing that's out there for people to bring. But otherwise, everything else will be taken care of. So next Sunday will be a, a special Sunday. Uh, get rid of the weight. Get set free. And God's good. Talking about y'all's side, not mine. Glory to God. Uh, and then... Uh, Today, to let you know, this week on Tuesday is Celebrate Recovery, and this is just such an awesome ministry. Uh, there's real discipleship that's a part of that, and connections, and seeing changed hearts and changed lives, and that's one of the joys of my life, and this helps make that happen. So Celebrate Recovery. This Wednesday at 7 o'clock, there's going to be prayer. Uh, we've had some good groups along the way, but this past week, it was Dean and I. And I'm not going to be here this Wednesday. So I'd really rather Dean not be here praying by himself. I, that, that Somebody come pray with Dean, okay? Even if you just come for a few minutes, he'll be here for an hour. And uh, if you're invited to come pray. I think for just our church, Dean has been doing a thing, 40 days of prayer for the transition of pastor, to pray for Debbie and I, to pray for Wade and Cynthia, 
And that's been really glorious. And I would think with this transition within our church, we would want to come together to pray. Then, when I think about our country, <laughs> I'm thinking, how is we as Christians not be praying, praying together for our country? There's something ahead. I don't know what it is, but you can feel it. There's something ahead for our country. And so we want to come together and pray for our country. So I would invite you to come on Wednesday morning for, for the hour or any part of that. And please come help Dean in prayer. Okay? Uh, that's Wednesday. Wednesday night for youth and children meet. That starts at 530. We have dinner for youth and children. We appreciate those that help supply the dinner. And then uh, appreciate Eddie and Meredith and their service there. Uh, this afternoon, Sunday afternoon, today, whether you come at 5 for the meal or 5.30 for the dinner, there's a Bible study. Gil is leading it. There's a, over 30 people signed up for this Bible study. It's more than can meet in that room at CLC. So today the Bible study is changing and going to be in Jeter Hall. And so if, if you haven't been a part of this, this it's, it's time that you can connect to this. A week or two in, it'll be kind of past, you know, because they'll be going on in the study. But right now, they, they met last week, but it's still time to come join them to meet. But today, they're going to meet in uh, Jeter Hall, and we're so thankful for this Bible study and for Gil leading it. If you come at 5 o'clock, there's a potluck. If you don't want to come for dinner, you can come at 5.30 uh, and just come for the study. And uh, excited to have this kicking off and go. Uh, any other but any other announcements that we need to make next Sunday, one service, 1030. Please be mindful of that. That's big. If you come at 11, you'll miss all the good part. You just have to hear the sermon. That would be bad. So uh, come at 1030 and get all of it. Uh, we've had a group of men. We had somebody in our community call us and ask us if we do ramps. And uh, in this one family, they had two members of the family that needed a ramp. And so uh, we had some men of our church over a couple of weeks going and doing that ramp. And that family sent a thank you to our church and your congregation. And uh, we appreciate our men representing our church and representing Jesus uh, to build that ramp. And I got a note of appreciation, and it goes to the whole church uh, to, for that. And cover the expenses of that, those type things, and that's a blessing. Any other announcements? If there's not, we'll continue in worship. Eddie's going to lead us in our call to worship. We're talking about the church uh, and Ecclesia. We'll learn about that today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Who do we say that Jesus is? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. On this rock, God will build his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Lord, Help us learn how to fulfill our calling to be your church. Lord, we are your church. Lord, help us learn how to be disciples. Who are help me make disciples. Lord, teach us how to talk in the authority you have given us. For we are your people and your church. Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, you are our Savior.
3, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Lord. Sandra Byers with her surgery tomorrow, Lord Greg and Mimi Weston, their ongoing journey. 
uh, in, in, in this battle. And Lord, there's many others in the church that we can name uh, that, that are struggling with their health. We lift up Mike Grigsby today and pray for healing on his uh, headaches and just that you would bring health to him overall to get him to a stronger, better place, Lord, overall. Father God, in these days, our country is really on our mind. No doubt, uh, we just sense there's an intensity about things in our country in these days. I, I know that <clears throat> I come to the place where really pray that we would be one nation under God, indivisible, and that there would be liberty and justice for all. And that, to me, seems like a good prayer uh, in these days, Father God. And so, Lord, to be under God, we would pray for revival and renewal in our land, Lord Jesus. Uh, and, and so move in power and bring revival and stir that, Father God. Lord, we uh, do lift up our church here in this time of transition from one pastor to another. Leadership is important, Father God. And so we're praying for Wade and Cynthia as they prepare to come here and be a part of the future of this church and leading this congregation forward in your kingdom purposes. So, Lord, I would pray that you will bless them in their week and all the details of that. And, uh, Lord, I pray that for Debbie and I on our side of things as well. Give us strength and wisdom and guide us in that. Lord, we thank you for uh, our teachers, administrators in our schools, and that our students will be learning. We pray for our students. We also pray for them that they would know you in a personal relationship uh, and, and a saving faith, Father God. Lord, hear our prayers today. You, you, you know what's going on in our lives, and we thank you, and we come before you and humble ourselves before you and ask that you would lead and guide and heal, redeem and restore, and make us instruments of your grace to others. Hear us now as we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, you know we don't pass an offering plate, uh, although we might today, just because we've had a rough weeks and months uh we had a, we had our uh finance meeting this week and several things we have extra expenses and then <clears throat> very interesting to note that man all the time i've been here the finances have been solid and we've kind of stumbling to the finish line as far as my watch goes and that's frustrating uh almost any month i've been here the lowest that the that the tithes and offering has been in a month is, is 19 thousand and it takes about 20 a month but we've had good months but in the month of august our, our receipts of income of tithes and offerings was just over fifteen thousand dollars and it's like wow that's not good it's never been like that i don't know what's going on <clears throat> why that would be and it makes me feel bad you know going out but so just praying for the finances of the church in this moment those of you watching online, we're glad that you're able to join us. Know we'd encourage you, if you're able to give, to give in our personal finances. We know we trust the Lord, and we walk in that, and we know we're trusting the Lord for the church finances, and that He will see us through. But so, uh, joy to honor Him with our tithes and our offerings. In that, He's the one that provides. So let's stand and join together in the doxology and give Him praise for His provision in our lives and for the church. Praise the
came to the region of Kizir Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and some others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. When he commanded his, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Amen. It's been interesting for me kind of knowing that I was going toward retirement and, and then to think of you know, these last weeks of sermons and what to preach. And so uh, on, uh, for several weeks I was just going with scriptures and things where God has really impacted my life. On September the 1st, our scripture reading was from Psalm 93, and it's the test. You know, we do sermons, we hear these. Anybody remember what Psalm 93 is about? You have notes, you cheat. See, that's the advantage if you take notes. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. We're talking about the power of just being aware that the Lord reigns when you're in a trying, difficult situation, that God, God's got it. Sunday, September the 8th, I looked at 2 Corinthians 5, 14, uh, and, and there's some about love. Anybody remember anything from that week? 2 Corinthians 5, 14. I thought it was a real good sermon, and I remember that. Very good. Hey, glory to that. Now that's good. You're gracious. And that, yes. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.14, it can be translated two different ways. For the love of Christ controls us, or the love of Christ compels us. And to me, that's just a powerful thing, to be controlled by the love of Christ, and then compelled by the love of Christ. And... Uh, during the time I was engaging with that passage of scripture, I received a, ca a card in the mail. I got the card two times in one week. And it said, what a privilege we've been given by God to spend our lives giving his love away. And that just was a point of emphasis then that I want to be one who is controlled by the love of Christ then compelled by the love of Christ. Last week, September 15, we looked at 1 Samuel uh, 30, 1 through 6 particularly verse 6. Anybody remember anything from last week from those verses of Scripture? David had a really bad day. So if you ever think you have a really bad day, go read 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 6, just to compare. And sometimes it makes our problems not seem that great. You know, last Sunday I came to church and uh, I, I came to church, as I walked out to the car, there was uh, radiator fluid all under my car. And that's a bad day. But it doesn't compare to David's bad day. And, and, but still, what did David do? When he had that bad day, what did David do? Strengthen himself in the Lord. Strengthen himself in the Lord. And so, you know, we're going to have bad days, we're having bad things happen. But to learn in our lives how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. And uh, there was a day doing my Bible reading, and that just jumped off the page for me, how David strengthened himself, the Lord is God. And it was a several years journey, and then that got tied to a phrase, uh, strong enough to care, to be strong enough to care, and for us, really, to represent God in this world, to be strong enough to care, we're going to have to learn how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord to do that. These are moments when God really shape my life in powerful ways. Coming to today's message is real different for me. This message is a mess. I give you a warning in advance, okay? Part of the reason why it's a mess is because I'm sharing with you today kind of the dilemma that I am in thinking about the church and what's going on, not within this church, I'm talking about the Western church in particular, going on within the Western church today and, and it's something that I'm praying about and processing into. And very honestly, as I hope to get to, uh, it does somewhat play in a, a, a part in me retiring from ordained ministry, okay? 
you see up on the screen that word ecclesia, okay? And that's from a Greek word. Those are English equivalents, like those letters are English equivalents to the Greek letters. So if you make an English word out of the Greek word, it's ecclesia, which is translated in the verses we read today, it's translated as the word church, okay? First of all, to get started into this message today, I would ask you, I'm not asking for an answer. Other, other up till now, I was asking for answers, and there weren't a whole lot, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but, 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 but so, I'm not asking for answers on this. I want you to think in your mind and answer to yourself, what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of the church? And you to think, what is your answer to that question? And then when you think about your answer to that question, are you living into the answer of that church, to that, to that question? Here's the thing. In the Western church in particular, there's, there's almost like a consumerism that has come into the church. And, and we want to go to the church that's best for us, you know, or that I like the music there, or I like the preaching there. Or, and, and so we, we choose a church based on what we want. And we show up on Sundays for what we want. And the church in the Western world has become very consumer focused and trying to meet the needs of the congregation, like like you know, like you and so you're deciding are my needs being met, am I liking it? And and that has invaded the church in a pretty serious way. We're gonna look so so just to think what is the purpose of the church and to have an answer for that, and is your life lining up with that answer? In Matthew 16, 13 through 20 is an incredibly important passage of scripture in the history of the church. Jesus to do this verse, he takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. I want you to know that over the last two weeks, I've learned a bunch about this that I didn't know. And a part of it started watching The Chosen Season 4, because in The Chosen Season 4, Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and it is a cesspool. It is like a demonic place. And it's real obvious that Jesus, it wasn't like they were happening by there and they stopped there. Jesus very intentionally took his disciples to this gates of Hades place to have this conversation that he had with them. And, and, and it's wild to understand uh, how the, the darkness of Caesarea Philippi. It was a place of darkness, debauchery, uh, and occultism. It was a strong demonic oppression. And it's really, if you roll Las Vegas, New Orleans, and San Francisco into one, it's worse than that. And Jesus took his disciples there. Most Jews didn't go anywhere near Caesarea Philippi. And yeah. But when he took them to Caesarea Philippi, he then looked at his disciples and he said, who, who do they say that I am? And the disciples said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus looked very intentionally and intensely at them, and he said, who do you say that I am? You know, that's an important question for us to answer, too. Who do we say Jesus is? And then do our lives align with what our lips say? One of the one of the things is we like Jesus as our Savior, but it's a little bit different to walk with Him as our Lord. And so, do our lives say that not only He's our Savior, but He's also our Lord? Do our lives line up with that? But Jesus looked at them as disciples, and then He said, "Who do you say that I am?" And that's when Peter responded, and he said. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then responded to Peter, and this, this is intense. This, this response is intense, and there's a lot of things to unpack in this response. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood 
has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia. That was the first time Jesus had ever used that word with his disciples. For us, when we read this passage of Scripture, we're reading it 2,000 years later, and when we hear the word church, what do we think of? This. We drive by churches. We see churches every day. And, oh, a church. The disciples had no idea what he was talking about. We're going to come back to Ecclesia uh, in a minute. Because you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my Ecclesia. The disciples had never heard Jesus use that word before. And then he said, the gates of hell, the gates of darkness, will not prevail against it. And they were in one of the darkest, most vile places. And they shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed. Uh, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And in this response, Jesus uses that word, ecclesia. In the Greek, it means called out. And you know, one thing for us to know is that, that a part of being Christians is we are called out from the darkness of the world around us to walk in the love and the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. So one aspect of this is called out. But So that's in the root of it. But ecclesia in those days was an assembly. The, really the best, the best translation of that word is an assembly. And, and it almost, to say city council is messed up because, because you know, we have people that are on the city council, but this would be the community would come together into, a sim, into an assembly. They would come together in assembly and they would vote and they would make rules and they had authority to do things that affected the community and, and make rules and legislation for the community so that the, it wasn't specific people that do it. They were called out to come together and anybody could come. And then they would make rulings and vote and they had authority to, to make things, okay? Uh, rules, rules and legislation for, for their community. So it's, it's, a fast, it's a fascinating thing to consider trying to understand what must have come to the disciples' mind when Jesus said, you know, Peter, you are the rock, and on this I will build my ecclesia. And you wish you could talk to the disciples and say, what did you think when he said that? Or even to talk to Jesus and say, Jesus, what did you mean when you used that, that, that word? Here's the interesting thing about these passages of Scripture. Because the controversy that, that, that of these passages of Scripture is that, is that the biggest controversy is about what Jesus meant when he talked to Peter and said, you are the rock. In the early service, I had the uh, wireless and I got used to walking around. I had to stay here, sorry. Uh, when he said, Peter, you're the rock, and so I'll build my church. In the Catholic church, have you ever heard the phrase apostolic succession? In the Catholic church, have you ever heard the apostolic succession and what that applies to? Okay. In the Catholic Church, they'll talk about apostolic succession. And what they're talking about is that God gave authority, Jesus gave authority to Peter. And that authority has been passed through the ages to the current Pope. Two weeks ago, I could have taken you into my library and I could have given you a book that said the apostolic succession of the Catholic Church. And it's about the popes that they say go all the way back to Peter. And the really bizarre thing is the first three of them are no names you hadn't even heard of. Like if you read about church history and everything like that, the first three names, you never it's hard to find them in church history. But they put them in there that that's a part of the apostolic you know, succession of the church. It's, it's, it's kind of weird, okay? But that's the Catholic. You know, when I say Catholic, you know we were Catholic till in the 1500s, right? Right? That was us. We split apart in the 1500s. And I'm going to get to that. Because in the 1500s, it, it, it arose 
more that what Jesus was talking about was that confession, the rock that he's going to build his church on is the confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that confession of Jesus is the Christ is what God is going to build his church on. It was interesting yesterday uh, at the celebration of life for my parents uh, that we read John 11, uh, 25 through 27, which is often read at funerals. But Jesus said to her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. And so you get that that's important and it gets tied to there to like have an eternal life is knowing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the chosen, I hate I, I mean, chosen in the Bible, okay, but, but when Jesus did this with his disciples, and I've been watching this in the chosen just recently, so that's how it's fresh on my mind. Is when Peter made this, when Peter made this declaration, the focus of Jesus' ministry changed. It's like, okay, you guys get it. Peter, you didn't figure this out on your own. The Holy Spirit has helped you understand that I'm the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And so now the focus of my ministry is changing. Up to these times, a lot of times he had been a peacemaker. He would try to smooth things over and you know, keep the peace. But from this moment on, he knows he's going to Jerusalem. And he knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And in the chosen, one of the things that happens is right after this, a lot of times whenever the Pharisees would come around, Jesus would either walk away or he wouldn't you know, but but in the but he just starts mixing it up with them. Like you brood of vipers, you know, like you whitewashed tombs. And all of a sudden, he's like, man, he, he ain't running from them. He's like taking them straight on. But that's because he knows now he's headed to the cross. And three different times, he told the disciples that I'm going to be crucified and the third day resurrected. It's really, you know, the chosen is great because he says that. And you see the disciples look at each other like, what is he talking about? Because you're the Messiah. You're going to establish your kingdom. You know, I want to sit by your throne, the right hand and the left. And, you know, they saw a physical kingdom. And Jesus is talking about something totally different. And the other thing is, I really think Ecclesia was, was kind of a ruling body. And Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God on earth, his kingdom. And that Ecclesia more has to do with us living in our authority and walking in our authority. I, I, when I sent that in, I don't always get to proofread it. It said to talk in the authority of Christ. And there's something to like speak in the authority of Christ. But that was meant to say to walk in the authority of Christ. And for us, that's a part of being the ecclesia is walking in the authority of Christ, knowing that we can speak in the authority of Christ to this earth. And, and that that's a part of that. And it's not just wait here what the Pope has to say. But by the Holy Spirit, we learn what to say and how to live in that authority that has been given us. Okay? So that controversy about, was he talking about the Pope, you know, and the, the apostolic succession given to Peter? Or was it the declaration? That controversy is so big that to me it quite often wipes out figuring out what is ecclesia. What, what is what is Ecclesia Church? Okay, it's it's very interesting because Martin uh, out in um, Tyndale, made, I don't know, Tyndale made one of the first translations, and he translated congregation. They burned him at the stake, and a part of that was for translating the Bible, but another part was they didn't like it when the when uh, the King James version was done. That was. Uh, Henry the Eighth, you know, in the, in, they wanted it to be the church, or when the Catholic Church, their version, they wanted to say church because that put the authority within them, within the church, instead of saying the assembly or the congregation, because that makes it sound like maybe you got some authority, and and you know, in our in this deal, you don't have no authority. We're the authority. We're the church, and we're going to tell you about it. 
And then when the Bible began to get printed and come out, they said, no, you have authority. You have authority. And it's based on that proclamation that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But, but then in all of that, uh, the idea of what is the ecclesia for us. Okay, buckle your seatbelt for just a minute, okay? I'm fixing to give you a real thumbnail sketch, thumbnail sketch of the history of the church, okay? Uh, and, and it's to get us to a point. Uh, I used to teach semesters of this, and now I'm going to try in five to seven minutes to give you a thumbnail sketch of the church. Ecclesia, okay? Ecclesia. Because after Jesus had died in Acts 1, we get how many people were in the upper room praying? 140, okay? So an assembly, an assembly, 140 people praying. So like the result of Jesus' ministry basically was 140 people, and they're in, the, they're in the upper room praying. Then you go to Acts 2, and what happened in Acts 2? Day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. 3,000 people become believers. The assembly group, okay? And so, so you're going through Acts, and, and the church had said it several times. You'll read the Lord was adding to their number daily. In Acts 4, if you read it, it says, now there's 5,000 men that are a part of the ecclesia, you know, the church, whatever word you want to use. Uh, in, interesting that, that initially Christianity was looked to be a subset of Judaism, okay? And, and in that day, that was a good thing for Christians in the church because the Jews had this tenuous arrangement with Rome where they could still practice their religion, okay? And, and, and Rome didn't understand Judaism. We can't see your God. How can you, like, worship a God you can't see? And you just, you, you stay within the lines, and you can have your religion, although we don't understand it, but you're safe, and you can do that. And so initially, Christianity was a subset of that, and it was all good, except the problem with Christianity you know, mostly you're a Jew or you're not a Jew, kind of, you know. They weren't out trying to proselytize or get converts. And Christianity that's growing, they're added to their number daily. And so the Christian number is growing. It's not your typical little Jewish set. And then the other thing is, in Rome, who is Lord? Caesar. And all of a sudden, what are the Christians saying? Jesus is Lord. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait, y'all aren't like the other Jews because y'all are getting converts, and now y'all are saying that Jesus is Lord, and that's going against what we need in Rome. This all came to a head in 64 AD when Nero burned Rome and blamed the Christians. And then the... the, the, the Every, everything intensified off of that. Not long after Nero burned Rome and blamed the Christians, they started taking Christians. And there was one road where they would crucify Christians all on that road and set them on fire to light the road at night. And so things totally changed for Christians. You've heard of the catacombs, right? And the Christians started having to go into hiding and cover to begin to meet. And then all of a sudden, more and more, you know, they're trying to figure the Christians out. No, they're cannibals. Because when they meet, they eat the body and they drink the blood. And so, so over those coming years, it would wax and wane with the emperors about how intense the persecution was. But it was really intense under Nero and it would go up and down. But in 285 and 290, the, the persecution was at its absolute worst and greatest. There was an emperor, a Caesar, named Diocletian, and he, he didn't like that the Christians were declaring somebody else Lord, and he learned some stuff about the church, and he learned that they had bishops, and that the bishops knew where the churches met. And so he learned how to round up the bishops and he would bring the bishops in and he would torture the bishops to give up the churches. He would burn their eyes out. With, with, he would make them hold uh, or make them hold the, the things that, out of the fire. Uh, he would break bones. 
or they would put them on those stretch things, you know, to stretch all the joints, you know, out in their body to where, you know, <laughs> trying to get them to give up where the churches were and the bishops, the bishops wouldn't do that, okay? And so they were being tortured and sometimes even tortured to death. Uh, and that was in 290 to 300. Then there was an incredibly dramatic, crazy change. Uh, there got to be in the Roman world attention that there's already one guy in the east and one guy in the west trying to be the Caesar and they were coming together to fight and Maxentius or something like that but then Constantine was from the east okay and they were about to go into battle and the battle favored the Caesar from the west and so the Caesar the Constantine the emperor of the east was kind of the underdog. And the night before the battle, he had a vision, and it was a vision of this bright cross shining. So the next morning, he told all his soldiers to paint a cross on their shield. And he, he was just going off of the vision. He wasn't thinking God or Jesus or whatever. And they went into the battle with these crosses painted on their shield, and they won as the underdogs. And then he started trying to figure the cross out, and he realized that was the symbol of Christianity. So in 312, Constantine, the emperor, converts to Christianity. He's baptized. And then shortly after that, he declares that Christianity is the religion of the Roman Empire. So in 290 to 300, they're being severely persecuted to by 320, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. The real irony is in 325, Constantine calls for the Council of Nicaea. So all these bishops are limping in with broken legs. They're being led in because they're blind. They can't hold things because their hands have been burnt you know, into oblivion. And so they're limping in to go meet with the emperor, you know, the Caesar of Rome, where the one right before him is the one that tortured him and did all of those things to him. And so it's incredible irony as they went to meet with the emperor after the one before had been the one that had tortured him and they bore the marks in their body and they had lost friends and things like that. We would tend to think that, oh, it's a good thing, right, that it was made a religion. But it began to water down Christianity. Before, just think, just think about coming to church today. If, if, if you thought there was the possibility that the church could be raided and that you could be killed or that you could be tortured, would you have come to church today? That's what the Christians were facing. But then it became the religion of the of the empire and over time the religious positions begin to have prestige and even beyond that they begin to have wealth so that the people would vie for the positions you know within the church to get the prestige to get the wealth of those positions and the whole thing just began to wa get watered down I'm going to move us forward to, in 1054 uh, A.D., there was a split in the church between the East and the West. There was always in the Roman Empire this kind of division between the East and the West. But in 1054, there was the East-West Schism. The only reason why I mention that is just a marker, because from 1054 on was the Dark Ages, and the church was jacked up. Okay? I can't, have you heard, have you heard of the Inquisition? During those years, the Inquisition happened. The church instigated the, the Inquisition, but later on, even the political leaders began to see the power of what could be wielded by the Inquisition, and even later on, the, the political leaders were doing Inquisition-type things. Uh, also during that time was the Crusades. And again, you're talking about something just jacked up, you know, that, that was how things were done, you know, to get people to go kill people in the name of Jesus, you know, uh, for the Crusades. But then also came indulgences during that period of time. And with an indulgent, you could pay 
to make sure your loved one went to heaven. Think about what that does for the blood of Jesus. The indulgences got so bad that there became a guy named Tetzel. He was the Catholic guru of knowing how to do indulgences. And Tetzel developed a saying. He would preach a sermon that explained indulgences. And it was a total travesty of a mess. But they didn't have Bibles to look at. And he represented the church. And he would explain indulgences. And then he would close... And he would say, when a coin in the coffer clings, a soul from purgatory springs. Again, I want you to think about what that does to the blood of Jesus. Because it becomes less about the blood of Jesus and putting money in the coffer to take care of your sins or the sins of your relatives. On top of that, during this period of time, they begin to have relics. And you could pay to go see relics. And when you paid to go see relics, it would bring favor to you. If you were able to look on the bones of Peter or the, the shroud of Jesus or whatever, all of these things got on Martin Luther's nerves. And he is quoted as saying, 15 of the 12 apostles are buried in Spain and you can pay money to go see their remains. Because it became a corrupt mess. Martin Luther, as he went into the uh, priesthood, he began to struggle even seeing all the corruption in the church. And so his mentor sent him to Rome thinking that if he went to Rome, it would stir his faith to be in Rome. But he was interesting, as, as he was entering Rome, a, a prostitute came and, and propositioned him and, and he looked at her and she said, I'm a priest. And she said, yeah, we know. Our brothel goes for the priest. It was a brothel for the priest. And so that was the state of the church. When Martin Luther went and posted his 95 theses on, on the church at Wittenberg, he wanted to see the reformation of the Catholic Church, but what instead happened is he started the Protestant Reformation and new churches began to be formed, Calvinist, Lutheran, Baptist, and, and, and a whole lot. And he couldn't have imagined what he was setting in motion. Did you know now in the, in the world today there are 45,000 different denominations now? Jesus said they will know because we are one. And now we got 45,000 different denominations. I go into all of that because I want to tell you today, I believe that especially for the Western church, we have looped around and we have reached a tipping point. Because today, the Western church is really good at making church members and playing into the consumer Christianity and that it is a struggle within the church to, to make disciples and to make disciples who are making disciples. I would come back to you and I would pose the question, what is the purpose of the church? And for me, and I'm preaching, I'll preach on this next week, for me, I love when Jesus called the first disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I believe, you know, just, just think, if you got the Bible, you got a New Testament, and you started reading the New Testament for the first time, I mean, you didn't know anything about anything, and you started reading the New Testament, and then somebody took you to church. And I think you would think, how does this relate to this? Because Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then Jesus concluded by saying, go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and where we're at with what, we, what church is today. And I believe we're reaching a tipping point to the point that, that it's become ineffectual in many ways. It makes church members instead of disciples. And across our country today, churches are closing at an incredible rate. And also, if you were to go on tour and go to 
you know, just little churches around. The vast majority of those churches, everybody at the church would be 60 years old or older. The cause of Christ is not in danger, okay? But what we in the Western world have made church. I got a question for you. If a shoe factory quit making shoes and it started making purses, would it still be a shoe factory? <laughs> Xander, I love I, I love watching kids. <laughs> okay? And, and what is the church? You know, what are we called to, to be involved in? A number of years ago in L.A., there was a large church, and they wanted to start a, a church in a poor neighborhood, so they got some people who would volunteer to go start this church in a poor neighborhood. They had the idea of how to attract people. There was one of the women that was willing to go, and she had a recipe and a method for making the best fried chicken ever. And so they, to start this new church, they were going to have a chicken lunch following church on Sunday and she would make her chicken and they would help her do it. The problem was people would come at noon they wouldn't come to church and they would just come show up for the lunch and they were having a big turnout for the lunch and not so many for the church and so the church was really struggling financially so they figured out what they needed to do was charge for the meals at lunch on Sunday and they started doing that and the church finances began to get right as rain pretty fast. And they said, man, this is working, so how about we sell some chicken on Saturday? And so they started selling chicken on Saturday, and they started like having a ton of people there, and they started adding days. Until finally they said, you know, that thing we're doing on Sunday morning is getting in the way of selling chicken in our restaurant. So they closed the church, and the name of the restaurant is First Church of God Grill. We might ought to think about what is the church created to do? And are we doing it? And big is figuring out what that word ecclesia is supposed to mean. And, and really it meant a ruling class and Jesus, a, a ruling assembly that ruled. And we're supposed to be in the kingdom of God, helping rule in the kingdom of God by the authority that we have in Jesus Christ. So what is the purpose of the church, the ecclesia? And in Acts 17, 6, it says, <clears throat> they said of the church, it was said of the church, they are turning the world upside down. Are we turning the world upside down today? Doesn't seem like it, does it? God's heart is for this lost and hurting, broken world. We've made church about being a member and membership has its privileges and we, we want it how we want it and those type of things. Right. I, this 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 is in me these days. I'm praying through this. I'm figuring this out, and this doesn't wrap up in a bow. But uh, this does play into my retirement. But I need to kind of talk to you into that. Okay. Number one is I'm retiring because I I really I'm looking forward to spending time with Debbie. Okay. Uh, and she retired a few years ago, and I'm looking forward to spending more time with her. Many of you know we're going by our four grandkids, nine, seven, five, and three, and I just feel called that that's a calling to be with them in these years of their life, and we have the capacity to do that, and those years just go by, and the time that we spend in Fort Worth over these last months, these last six weeks, has just reinforced that, of how important, how powerful that is, and, and we're excited about that. I meet with guys, uh, funny with Caleb sitting here today, uh, Caleb's brother-in-law, John, is one of the guys that's been meeting with us for a while. And uh, about two years ago, I guess, we were about to have a, a, one of our retreats, one of our meetings. And John said, hey, be praying for my brother-in-law, Caleb. I'd really like for him to come meet with us, you know. And so I was praying for Caleb to come. And Caleb was a no-show at our men's retreat. And I was like, mom, you know, man, I was looking for it. And I love John, so I thought it would be cool. Didn't, didn't know what I was going Two weeks later... I go and I'm like, hey, he said, he said, hey, I'm Caleb White. I'm John Bashy's brother-in-law. I'm like, dude, like, you know, like, you were supposed to be at our retreat. What were you doing? But, but in that, he and I started meeting because it's kind of in that context. And I, 
I meet with guys and do discipleship, okay? And, and to me, that is the most church I have any time. Wednesday night at dinner this week, Friday morning at a breakfast this week, I had church both of those times. And uh, our last meeting kind of in the week before, I love those meetings, and I feel like that's being the church and helping make disciples. And in my retirement, I'm going to keep meeting with men, keep doing that men's ministry, encouraging men to be men of God uh, and, and living that out in their lives. Many of you hear me talk about Arrows of Light. That's a ministry, Fletches to Lose, that was founded a number of years ago. And I'm really involved in that in Guatemala and in Costa Rica. And I'm looking forward to being able to give myself more fully you know, to that and to those times. And I feel like that that helps make uh, disciples. Uh, it's real interesting. We haven't done a conference in Costa Rica since 2008. And now we're getting ready to do one in January. And some of the adults that are helping us were kids that are, were at our conferences in the early 2000s and there it's an excitement and looking forward to that but i will tell you that this sermon comes into play because i have grown tired and weary in my life in pastoral ministry of trying to be involved in making disciples when the ruts toward church membership the ruts toward church membership are so deep and intense and you're wanting people to be disciples of Jesus who are helping make disciples. And they get involved in the church and it just tends toward the ruts of being a church member. And that's a real different thing. Okay? And, and I have, I have I've exhausted myself in that. Okay? And challenging that. One of the things, can, William, can you put up our, our church uh, motto? One, one of the things, our, our mission statement, one of the things that was awesome when I came here was this was the mission statement of the church when I came here. And you know, I put it out there till we almost kind of learned it for a while. Partnering with God and transforming people into fully devoted disciples of Jesus for the glory of God. And, and, and like, what does that look like? Okay, what does that look like? We talk about what is the mission of the church? What is the purpose of the church? Gladewater Methodist Church has said, this is our mission. How is your life connected into that mission? Or are you just coming to church? That's where I'm at in my life in these days, right there in that. I think there's something new coming. I think there's about to be a new reformation. And I really want to be in the position to just have the freedom to flow into that. I, I catch glimpses of it and wind of it. Right now, right now, there's primarily two churches, two kinds of churches that are big succeeding. One is the uh, mega church. And the mega church succeeds because it caters to the consumer Christianity. You come and you put an offering in the offering plate. We give you all these programs for you and your family. The other church that's thriving is the churches that are doing really good with small groups. And to me, that's the reformation. That's part of this reformation is churches that learn to do small groups well. To where, to where you can invite somebody to come to your house or to somebody's house, not on a Sunday, and they get involved, and sometimes through that they get involved in the life of the church, or sometimes they just get to know about Jesus and learn about Jesus through that small group and, and that deal. Uh, discipleship and individually and all that is a harder, longer, slower process, but I do believe that's part of it as well. God's Spirit is moving. I know this has kind of a sad, depressing side to it, but that's not the side to focus on, although to be aware of that, that but know that God's spirit is stirring and there is a reformation coming. God is committed to this. And that's why we're here over 2,000 years later because disciples have been made even within the church. But, but right now in the Western church, there are strong ruts towards just being church member. That's why I love Emmaus Walk because it's a renewal tool for God within the church today. That's why I love Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is a great ministry for discipleship. And one of the great things, when somebody comes to Celebrate Recovery, they're kind of admitting, I've got a problem, I need some help. And most of the time we show up to church because we want to enjoy it. And 
have it our way. Help us, Jesus. Amen? That God is committed to the cause and His Spirit is stirring. And I hope this makes some kind of sense to you. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to understand Ecclesia, what Jesus meant by that, what the disciples heard, what you want the church to be. Lord, help us to be a part of that. Lord, let us by your spirit kind of ponder these things today and then lead us by your Holy Spirit. Uh, I know I feel like for Debbie and I, you're leading us by your spirit into the next season of our lives. And it's going to be about being disciples, making disciples, being the ecclesia as well, Father God, in the world today. To turn the world upside down for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand close today. Sing the glory to God. When we walk